Why is it that churches have problems? Well, that's because there are people in churches. That's, that's the nature of the beast. But why is it really not problems, but, but why is there dysfunction? Why is there unhealthiness in a church? Now, I won't have, have you raise your hands, but, but think, of how many of you have been in a church when there was a time or that church, the whole time you were there, it was a dysfunctional church. My dad pastored a church for less than two years uh, when I was very young, and <laughs> he, uh, he was warned not to go to that church by professors. Uh, it, it, was, it, it killed pastors. It was known for a church that just killed pastors, and, and, and many of them got out of the ministry. And it was a church that never became a healthy church. Never. Never. Now, why is that? Why is it that churches are dysfunctional? It's the same reason why your home is dysfunctional at times. And it's the same reason why at work it's dysfunctional and at times. And it primarily boils down to this, that, that the husband doesn't understand his role, the wife doesn't understand her role, and or they're serving each other based on what they want out of pride and arrogance. Why is that happening at work? The employer doesn't understand his role. The employee doesn't understand his role. And when they're trying to function together, when they're trying to do their job, they're doing it unto themselves. They don't see the big picture. There's pride and arrogance. It's about them. And guess what? The same thing is true in the church. The reason why churches are dysfunctional is because the pastor doesn't understand his role or is not willing to do it. Church members don't understand their role and they're not willing to do it. And or that as they serve together, they're serving out of pride and arrogance, not out of humility. It's about what that person wants or what that pastor wants the other members of the staff, whatever, rather than what, what is best for all of us and serving out of humility unto God. Now that's exactly what Peter is going to help us see today because what we need to do as the church of Jesus Christ is to get back to the basics. And so today I'm calling this, this, uh, this sermon Church 101. Church 101. And Peter does a great job of really helping us see this. Now, I've never preached from this text today. I've never preached from this passage. And I've never really preached about a congregation's responsibility to the pastor specifically. Because so often that is misinterpreted. It, it comes across self-serving. Uh, we got a bully pulpit. You know, somebody's using the pulpit to try to bully the congregation and making them do what he wants. I've always been very, very sensitive about that. But we're preaching through 1 Peter, right? And uh, you, can't, you can't skip the text. Well, what, would I, what would happen today if, so well, I don't want to preach on that, so we're just going to skip it. Well, we'd have some other serious discussions about my ineptness uh, in the pulpit. So let's open our Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 5 and Today, well, next Sunday will be the last Sunday that we have in 1 Peter. And so it's coming to a close. Remember, he's writing to Christians who are being persecuted for their faith. And, uh, and, and so he helps us understand that there's a living hope in Jesus Christ and how to apply that hope in different venues of life. And it's like he kind of now comes back to that theme as he's helping the church understand how to live uh, in full power and full authority. So let's uh, look at the text. First Peter chapter 5, we're going to look at verses 1 through 7. Therefore, as a fellow elder and witness to the sufferings of the Messiah, and also a participant in the glory about to be revealed, I exhort the elders among you, shepherd God's flock among you, not overseeing out of compulsion, <clears throat> but freely, according to God's will, not for the love, or not for the money, but eagerly, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you younger men, be subject to the elders. 
and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, because God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that He may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon Him, because He cares about you. So obvious, you can see, see the point that I'm trying to make in the introduction about how we're supposed to relate to each other. Now, why is he saying this? Notice he begins by saying, therefore, another hinge word. And what Peter is saying <coughs> is this. The church is experiencing outside persecution and outside influences, circumstances of life that have nothing to do with what's going on in the church. These fellow believers are experiencing suffering. And what is he saying? Don't bring that suffering into the church. <coughs> Don't let that outside influence affect the way that you relate to each other within the body of Christ. How many times have you gotten in an argument with your spouse and, and, or you reacted? Let's say, let's say this. You reacted a certain way to your spouse, but it had nothing to do with your spouse. Something bad happened at work. Something happened at school. Uh, so you bring that into the home and, 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 and that circumstance is outside the home, had nothing to do with the home, but you're reacting internally because of that outside influence. And that's what he's saying about these Christians. Don't bring that outside uh, problem into the church. You need to know how to relate to each other in times of suffering. Because I dare say a lot of the problems in the church are because of outside influences, <clears throat> whether it's at work or in the home or other situations, and that's brought into the church, and we react to things in the church that have nothing to do with the church. And so that's the balance that he's trying to bring here. Uh, and, and then notice he gives advice how we're to respond to each other. Peter describes himself, notice, as a fellow elder. I can relate to the pastors. Witness to the sufferings of Christ. He was an eyewitness of Christ who suffered and who was exalted. And he is a participant in the glory to come that is, in the revelation of Jesus Christ, the second coming of Christ. <clears throat> so now Peter addresses the pastors. He tells them their role. He helps the rest of the congregation understand their role and how to serve together with humility. All right, so notice, first of all, pastors are to shepherd God's flock. That's my role. Pastors are to shepherd God's flock. Notice he's addressing the elders. We get our word presbytery or Presbyterian from this word, all right? And these are the appointed leaders, spiritual leaders of the church. He's not making a reference to age, most scholars believe, but to spiritual maturity. These are the ones that have been appointed to be those spiritual leaders of the church. Paul went around, as you read in the book of Acts, appointing elders at churches. These are the guys who are the point men. These are the guys who are on the spiritual front for the church. In times of persecution, the pastors were the ones who were targeted the most. They had the big bullseye on their back. Because if we can get the pastor, we can get the congregation. That's what Satan is trying to do. Satan's trying to target the pastor so that he can get to you. And, and, and it helps you know how to pray that I'll speak to in just a few moments. Now, <clears throat> notice that in the New Testament there are words, and we see these in this text, there are words that are used interchangeably for the office of the pastor. Here we find the word elder. All right? So we've already addressed that. That's the spiritual leader. He's a guy of spiritual maturity. Then you see in this text the word shepherd. He says shepherd God's flock. That's, can, that same word can also be translated pastors. When you find the qualifications for pastors in 1 Timothy that's the word that is used. It's the same Greek word, but it's translated pastor. So a shepherd is a pastor. He's the one who tends the flock. He cares for the flock. He feeds the flock. Then you see this word overseer. It's used here in this text. He's telling them to oversee uh, the congregation. <clears throat> we get our word episcopal from this church. This word can also be translated bishop. He's an overseer or bishop. And that's a manager. That's the steward. That's the guy who's responsible for the overall direction of the church. So what you find is one office, but three different functions. What we find in the New Testament, there are only two offices in the New Testament church. The office of the pastor and the office of the deacon. 
And so what you find are these elders are pastors who have different functions. They oversee, they help manage, they give direction to the church, they tend to the flock, they care for the flock, and uh, they also feed and teach the flock, and they have the responsibility of being the spiritual leader of the church. Now, there are different theories about church polity as it relates to pastors and elders, and I'm not going to split hairs on that. But, but, but I believe that there are two offices. Uh, you don't have a separate office that is addressed, qualifications for a separate office. It's just one office that has different functions, and, and I have to function in all those responsibilities. And the word here, he's addressing the elders, and there's various churches that he was addressing, but often in these ch one church, Paul particularly would address, would, would appoint several elders or pastors to help manage and shepherd and tend to the flock there. Now, Peter commands the pastors here to shepherd God's flock. Now, uh, let me just say this. I don't have time to get into this, but we've lost the art of shepherding God's church. We've lost the art of pastoring. Because I really need this point. I really need to be preaching to pastors right now. Because, because I'm, I'm concerned about what's happening to the office of the pastor in the New Testament church today. One pastor I know who's very popular, he's on TV, everybody in the room would know who he is. Spends 40 hours a week in his study. The only time that he sees his congregation is on Wednesday night and on Sunday morning. Does no counseling, ne never goes to the hospital, does not do any of that, 40 hours. I, I, I personally don't get that. I don't, I don't see how you can effectively lead your church and preach to your church if you don't understand what's going on in your congregation. You don't understand the needs. Now, <clears throat> again, I, I think I understand why he does that. I, I understand the rationale. But, but here we find that Peter is saying, shepherd God's flock. And we're going to see how that is spelled out in just a moment. He's defining their role. John 21, 6, Jesus told Peter, Peter, Peter's being restored by Christ. Remember, he denied Christ three times. And Jesus here is addressing him on the shore of the Sea of Galilee and restoring Peter. And he tells him to shepherd God's flock. He says, shepherd the sheep. Now, two other times he says to tend the sheep or feed the sheep. That's what that word means in that context. But one of those three times he uses a different word, this word, to shepherd God's flock, to care, to feed for them. Now, obviously, he's using the metaphor of a shepherd and sheep. Why is that? Well, sheep are gentle creatures, gentle animals. They need tender care. They don't need to be fussed at. They don't need to be bossed around. Even when they're wrong, even when they're going somewhere else, they need tender care. They're defenseless. They need protection, but they also need to be rescued at times. And they may not like that because they think they're in a place they should be or want to be, but they're not. And that's where the shepherd has to rescue the sheep. They're prone to stray, prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. That great hymn we sing. Yeah, that's what we all do. We, we have that tendency that pronation to leave the God that we love. And so we need direction. We want to eat in the right pasture as a sheep. And so we need to be led and fed. You see, a rancher drives cattle. A shepherd leads sheep. And so the shepherd needs to lead the sheep to the right pasture, to the Word of God, to be fed. There are a lot of words being spoken out here. There are a lot of... A lot of angles to biblical truth. But the shepherd needs to lead them to the right pasture and let them be fed by the Word of God. Sheep need a shepherd. Now, some of the commentators say that sheep smell bad and they're dumb. Now, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. But no, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. They did say that, though. But notice he says, shepherd God's flock. Now, listen, this is important. Shepherd God's flock. This isn't my flock. You are not my flock. You are God's flock. I'm the under-shepherd. He talks about the chief shepherd, Jesus Christ, in a minute. I'm the under-shepherd. 
And I have the responsibility of shepherding you, but you are God's flock. So it's a great privilege, it's a great responsibility to do that. Uh, and I'll address that in just a moment. But how does the shepherd serve? Notice, he, he, he tells the shepherd how to serve. Serve willingly. In verse 2, not overseeing out of compulsion, but freely. That means with a free heart. Look, this isn't a job that you have as a shepherd. That there ought to be something that's motivating you beyond the idea that this is a job. And if, if you're not serving with a willing heart, the result is a loss of joy that ends up hurting the church. Why do pastors lose their joy? Why, why do they lose their focus in serving in a church, in pastoring a church? Because they're not doing it willingly. They see it now as a job. I heard a, 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 a staff member told me one time, this is just a job to me. But, and there was no joy in the service. It was obvious because they lost perspective. Here he's addressing laziness. He's, he's helping the pastor say, don't be lazy. There needs to be something inside of you that is motivating you to serve out of a willing heart. Secondly, serve passionately. Verse 2, not for the money, but eagerly. Why serve? Why does the minister serve? For the pure love of Jesus Christ as our chief shepherd. I, I, I'm serving out of a love for Christ and a love for his people. Because if you're doing it for another reason, that leads to impure motives. It leads to embezzlement, financial embezzlement, which I hate to say it happens in the church. I got a report one time of how many churches this past year were closed because of financial mismanagement. It was shocking how many churches in the United States were shut down by the IRS because of financial mismanagement. And, and much of that was personal embezzlement. Dishonest gain. Compromise. Because then, because see, if it's about money, then you look at people differently. Then, then why, why are you relating to some people and not to others? And why do you want some people in your church and not others? And it, it, it gets begin convoluted and you lose perspective about who the sheep are and that they're supposed to be a part of the church. This type of pastor is greedy. He's addressing the issue of greed. Then he says, serve submissively, verse 3. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. I'm not using my authority, my position to rule over the church for my own personal agenda or my own personal interest but serving the needs of the flock, and in that, being an example to you on how to serve. Now, yes, God has called me to lead, and that means that He gives me a vision to lead the church, but, but I have to make sure that that is what God wants, and it's not self-serving, it's not my interest, my agenda, but it, it's for the purpose of ministering to the needs of the congregation and actually helping those outside the flock as well. Matthew chapter 20, verse 25, Jesus helps address this issue. But Jesus called them over and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles dominate them, and the men of high position exercise power over them. It must not be like that among you. On the contrary, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. That's the model. That's the picture. All right. Notice he said that they've been entrusted to you. You shepherd God's flock who've been entrusted to you. That means that you've been given to me. And I'm a steward. I'm a manager. What that also means is that God has given this church the type of sheep that he wants here and the number of sheep that he wants here. I, I, I can't be hung up on the type of sheep. That's why I get a little nervous when, when you say we're only targeting this kind of person. I think the church ought to be for everybody. For everyone, regardless of age, regardless of type. And, and if you have that attitude, you just let God bring the sheep god god knows what type of sheep that we need and, and and so sometimes we're negligent about certain types of people that are out there that that feel like they don't belong and so we have to sometimes work on that type of 
person, that type of sheep, that we want to make sure they feel welcome. But the, the, but the Bible, I mean, the church ought to be for everybody. You look around this congregation, we've got all, all types of people. We, we've got, we've got uh, all different ages of people. You know, it's not a certain type of church. You go to one church and say, well, that's, that's, that's just a type of church. All the sheep are about the same. I think if you look around here, we're not the same. All different types of sheep that God has given us. And the number. I can't get worked up about that. God, that's your business. That's why we can accept each other. That's why we can work together. It's because it's God's flock. And God is the one that has entrusted those sheep to us. And so we learn to get along with each other. We learn to accept all the sheep that God has given us. But notice the motivation why pastors shepherd God's flock. Verse 4, And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. I'm under the authority of Jesus Christ. I learn how to shepherd from Him. Again, it's a great responsibility, but I'm accountable to the chief shepherd. And the Bible teaches us that in James 3, 1, that I will receive a stricter judgment. Hebrews 13, 17 says that I will give an account. I'm ultimately responsible for what happens here at Linwood Baptist Church. And believe me, that keeps me on my knees. Well, they this and they that and they that. I can't say that. I'm responsible, ultimately, for what's going on here. And so I want to make sure that I'm hearing from God as I serve you and as I lead you. Pastors shepherd God's flock. So I want to encourage you, some of you do this already, pray for me every day. Please, pray for me every day. Lorraine Talley went home to be with the Lord recently. I didn't even thought about this till now. We were, we, I visited with Don Talley before the service, uh, that, a couple days before the service. And Don Talley said a very simple sentence to me that, that you can't imagine how it impacted me. You really can't. He said, Pastor, every night, Lorraine and I would pray, and every night, I'd pray for you. And, and you know, as people say that, and, and hopefully they do, but I believe Don Talley. I tell you, I walked out of that, that house, I said, God, thank you, I, I, I'm humbled. That, that, that somebody's praying for me. Well, when you drive around town, I'm going to give you an assignment. When you drive around town from now on, and you drive by a church, you don't even know that church, you don't know who the pastor is, pastor, I mean, just say, God, I, I pray for that pastor, I pray for that shepherd. You pray for that church. If you know his name, call him by name. God, I pray for Ron Watts. I pray for Gary Brothers. I pray for Dan Green. I pray for whoever. Just pray for him. I tell you, to make it, it, it'll make a difference in that, that pastor's life. Secondly, pastors shepherd God's flock. Members follow the pastor. All right? So listen carefully. Do not misinterpret what I'm about to say. I'm really, I've really prayed hard about this. All right? Verse 4, he says, younger men. It probably, there's a lot of theories about this, but probably it just means that. There are younger men in the congregation. They're, they're younger than the elders, the pastors of the church. Now, why is he addressing the younger men? Because they're more apt to struggle with authority. You know, when, when we were younger, we all knew what was right. We had all the answers. Now, when you get older, you realize... There are a lot more questions you have than you have answers. So all, all you young guys got all the answers. Just wait. Especially when you start having kids. You're going to have a whole lot more questions than you do answers. Didn't you have all the answers to parenting before you had children? <laughs> and then God undid you. All right? We all have the answers. Uh, and, and, it, and it's true in church life, see? Sometimes younger guys, you know, they have a problem with authority. And so he's addressing them. Older people have learned, and they understand the role of the pastor. So he's not addressing them. He doesn't need to. And women would understand the need to submit or follow the leadership of the pastor because of the culture of that day. They, they understood that, that that's a, that man is in that position, 
regardless of how you feel about all that, that it's just the way that it was in that day and time that they would have a natural understanding of following the leadership of the pastor. But he says, be subject to the elders. The word subject, it's also translated submit. Chapter 2 and 3, uh, he talks about citizens are to submit to the government, uh, employees, uh, slave to the master, submit, wives, submit to your husbands. It's the same, exact same word. Exact same word. So I line myself up under the authority of the one who is the leader. Now he's saying that members are to follow the leadership of the pastor. Why is that? Because they are accountable to God. The, the pastor is accountable to God. They are accountable also to the congregation. Here in our church, we have what's called a deacon council. Six men elected by the church. I'm accountable to them. In fact, this week, my review will be done. Every, every year, I have a review. They, they, there's a check and balance there. I just don't have the freedom to do whatever I want. It's not a, a rubber stamp committee. Uh, there are things that I've mentioned, and they said, this is not the right time, Pastor, or that's not a good idea. Uh, there's, there's high accountability there. And, 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 and yet, I have a great sense that they're willing to follow my leadership as God has given me that role to do that. I don't feel like I, I'm not able to lead you because of that accountability to the deacon council and ultimately to the congregation because I'm accountable for my moral and ethical behavior. You, you, you need to call me out on that. And also, if I'm not preaching the Word of God, if I'm not handling the Word of God accurately, you have a right and responsibility as a church to call me out on that. And to say, wait a minute, we can't have a pastor misleading us in teaching the Word of God. Or somebody who is immoral or unethical in the way that they do church work. The way that they relate to the congregation. So there's high accountability there. And the ministers are to be servants, obviously, not dictators. So why should you follow a pastor? Well, their role is to lead. That's the, that's the job that God has given the pastor, is leading the congregation. They are responsible for the congregation. They will receive a stricter judgment for their role. They will be, uh, the, excuse me, the church will be unified, obviously. We'll be together if we're doing our roles. I'm leading the way that I should, and you're following the way that you should. The church will have one direction and one purpose. Listen, a house divided cannot stand. It cannot stand. And so, again, if I'm leading and you're following in a God-glorifying way, then we have one direction, one purpose. We're all on the same page, and the church will have victory. church will be healthy. It'll be a functional church, not a dysfunctional church. People want to be a part of the church. They're not going to run from the church. Nobody wants to be part of a dysfunctional church, an unhealthy church. They want to be a part of a healthy, vibrant, dynamic, growing church where everybody understands their role. So, listen, what are the options? I'm negligent in leading. You're negligent in following. Chaos, dysfunction, unhealth, unhealthy church. No, we don't want that. I have a role. You have a role. And if we're both doing our role, the kingdom of God advances. Again, God is glorified. Hebrews 13, 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account so that they can do this with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Pastors shepherd God's flock. Members follow the pastor. Third, everyone serves with humility. <clears throat> everyone serves with humility. Verse 5, all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. All of you being the entire congregation, pastors, everybody else. Clothe yourself. That word was used to describe a slave who would put on an apron when he would serve. And so he's saying to us, when we put that apron on of service, it is an apron of humility toward one another. What is humility? I've experienced God's grace as a sinner. You've experienced God's grace as a sinner. And I'll tell you, if we get that down, it goes a long way. That, that's, that's what I am. I'm a sinner who has been saved by God's grace. Now here he's quoting Proverbs 3.34. James also quotes this. And what he's showing is a logical conclusion. Notice what he says. God resists the proud, 
You can live that way, but God resists that. No blessing. God gives grace to the humble. Therefore, I should humble myself. If I want God's grace, I need to humble myself. If I want to experience God's resistance, then I can just serve you with pride and arrogance, and you can serve each other with pride and arrogance. And God resists that. God will resist that church that operates that way. Now, humbling myself in this context means I'm embracing my suffering. I'm embracing the trouble. I'm embracing the discontent. I'm embracing the different views and ideas. But as these believers are being persecuted outside the church, he says, don't bring that into the church. Embrace it. What did Jesus do? He humbled himself by embracing the cross. What is your cross this morning? Embrace it. Humbly embrace it. And let that be your cross, that you'll be able to experience the grace of God in your life. Now, what's the purpose of grace? Notice he says to experience the power of God, the mighty hand of God. That power, that hand of God changes me. It gives me perspective. It, it, it helps me, it sustains me through whatever I'm going through. It gives me the right response that I need. The purpose of grace is to change us. It saves us, it sustains us, but it changes us. Grace is not just something that I got when I got saved. It's not about me getting into heaven, it's heaven getting into me. It's God getting into me and God changing me. It's Colossians 1.27, Paul says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's Christ changing you and changing me. Notice, then He will exalt us. He will lift us. I can't do that. How many of us have tried to lift ourselves, exalt ourselves? Not in an arrogant or prideful way, but we've tried to work it out, fix the problem. Can't do that. We've tried to solve problems in the church, in the flesh. It doesn't work that way. It's letting God exalt us, humbling ourselves before Him and letting Him exalt us. Notice He says, in due time. He will exalt us in due time. Probably the second coming, but it means in every trial, He'll lift us. He will encourage us. Our choir sings a song that was written by uh, or, uh, Cymbala's wife, uh, uh, Carol Cymbala, at the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir in New York City. And we, we sing this song. It's one of my favorites. It comes straight from Psalm 3. Listen to the words. Lord, how my foes increase. There are many who attack me, as David is writing this. Many say about me there is no help for him in God. But you, Lord, are a shield around me, my glory and the one who lifts up my head. I cry aloud to the Lord, and he answers me from his holy mountain. I lay down and sleep. I wake again because the Lord sustains me. Well, that's a great passage of Scripture. If it's hard for you to lift your head this morning, I want you to read Psalm 3. Read Psalm 3 and let Him lift up your head. Now, what should be my attitude while I'm suffering? While I humble myself, excuse me. Verse 7, casting all your care upon Him because He cares for you. My attitude of suffering is not resigning to the situation. I'll just give in to the situation. That's not humility. Humility is trusting God because worry is a form of idolatry. He says, cast all your care on him, all your worry or your anxiety. That's the way that word can be translated. And I'm to throw it on him. I just don't mention it and hang on to it, and mention it again and hang on to it, mention it. He says, cast it on him, throw it on him. Place all of your concern, all of your worry on him. Because, see, if I'm not doing that, then I'm worrying, and that means that I'm trying to figure out how to solve the problem. I'm not trusting God. I'm trusting in myself, and the proof that I can't solve the problem is the worry. I haven't figured it out, the anxiety. So I become my own God. He says, don't let that happen. Cast all your care on Him. Why? One of the greatest lines in all the Bible. Because He cares about you. 
You feel like God doesn't care about you? That's, that's Satan telling you that. That's not truth. Truth is that he cares about you. And he wants to help you with the suffering that you're experiencing. So let's try to pull this all together for just a moment. I've tried to shepherd this flock. I'm imperfect, I'm a human, but I've tried to shepherd this flock in a way that glorifies God, in a way that, that Peter has ascribed us to do so as a pastor. And I really believe that Linwood is a congregation who follows my leadership. I, I don't go home and I don't, I don't tell Karen, these people don't follow me, they don't care about me. I, I, I've never had to say that. I, I really sense, I really sense your attitude in following my leadership as I'm trying to follow the chief shepherd, Jesus Christ. And I really believe that Linwood is a church that is serving with humility, really has a concern for each other. I see the way you minister. I see the way that you help each other. Now, look, there are times that it gets about us. It happens to me, it happens to you. But when I really look at the big picture, I see a congregation that is committed to serving each other and committed to serving this community and committed to serving the world. Now, folks, that's a great testimony. And all that does is not, it's not about me, it's not about you. It's about God. It's about what God is doing because of people who are humbling themselves before God. The mighty hand of God. We can trust Him. And when it's not going our way, when we get worried or anxious, remember the context here. We just cast it on Him. Because He cares for you. He cares for me. He cares for Linwood Baptist Church. Why? Because His name's at stake. His reputation is at stake. So we can rest in Him and trust Him. I want to thank you for the great privilege of serving you. You're a blessing to me. And I want to thank you for the blessing that you are to so many people in our community and around the world. And, and, and more of that's going to happen in the days to come. And in that, we're together. We're together. We're a healthy, a healthy church. And we should never take that for granted. We should stop and give God the glory and the praise for that and thank Him for that. Now, I want us to do one other thing. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes, and I need to hurry. I know that. <clears throat> there's a worry. There's a concern. You're anxious about something. And it may be about something that's going on in the church, but probably it's about something else. In your personal life, where you work, at home, wherever, at school. Where's the worry? Where's the anxiety? Let's do what the Lord is telling us to do. Let's do that right now. I'm not going to have you act this out right now. But imagine that you are, you're standing before the cross. You're the only one there. Jesus is on the cross. And he's looking at you. He knows what the concern is. He knows, he knows you're hurting. But I want you to see that he cares about that issue. He cares about you. And I want you just imagining him looking at you with his arms stretched on that cross. And you just, with your hands, taking that concern, that anxiety, that worry, 
and just throwing your hands to the Lord openly. And imagining that concern falling at the foot of the cross. And His blood is dripping on that worry, on that concern. He's taking care of it because He cares for you. And I want you to walk out of here free from that worry and that burden, leaving it at the cross. Father, thank you that I'm reminded time and time again that I have to do that. So often I hang on to it. I keep bringing it back up. And Satan reminds, us, reminds me of, of so many things that I don't need to be worried about, be anxious. We're all human, and Lord, I know that that's our tendency. But God, help us to come to this one truth. Cast all your cares, your worries, your anxieties on Him because He cares. Jesus, you care for me. And that person who's here this morning and realizes that Christ died for their sin to provide a way to have a relationship with God is the only way because only one man died to take care of our sin problem, and that's Jesus. We're forgiven, we're free. And now we can live in freedom, in power. We can live in truth, in peace, in love because of Christ. I pray, God, that person will come this morning to give their heart to you. There's some in this room, Lord, who need to come home. They're in a far place. They don't need to be there in their mind or with their lives. Pray they'll come home today. They'll come to their senses and come home. They'll cast all of that at the foot of the cross and come to a father with arms wide open, ready to throw a party. I pray, God, for those who need to come and be a part of this fellowship here at Linwood. Be a part of a healthy, vibrant church that desires to glorify you and to spread the gospel of Christ everywhere we go. Others who need to come and pray to talk with someone. Jesus, you are a wonderful Savior. We yield ourselves to you. We humble ourselves before you now. In our response, in Christ's name, amen. We continue our worship.